Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Natasha Simons from ANS and I've got with me uh, Dr. Laurel Hack who's the Executive Director of ORCID. Hello. And we are coming to you live from the eResearch Australasia conference in Brisbane. But today we're going to be talking about all things ORCID. So that we had a bit of an historic moment at yesterday's eResearch conference where uh, Laurie and uh, Heath Marks from the Australian Access Federation signed a joint agreement so that the AAF can become the uh, institutional lead for the ORCID consortium in Australia. So that was a really exciting moment and there were lots of claps and cheers that happened in the ORCID Birds of a Feather session yesterday. So that's the first announcement. So our first speaker is Laurie and she's just going to talk about um, ORCID's adoption and use uh, internationally and what's happening with ORCID. So we just hand over to Laurie. Great. Thank you, Natasha. All right. So um, an acknowledgement of Open Access Week. Um, just ORCID, is, this is our very first participation, formal participation in Open Access Week. So congratulations to everybody. This has been a really, really good week for a lot of different organizations. Um, as Natasha mentioned, I'm going to be talking about ORCID, um, ORCID in Australia, but also um, talking about specific use cases for um, uh, organizations in adopting ORCID and also at the uh, second part of the talk will be how ORCID is being used in consortia um, in Europe and outside of Australia. So the big question, why do we need identifiers? Um, and as everyone on this call probably already knows, names are messy. And when I talk about names, um, ORCID deals with names for people, uh, but also we work with other organizations on names for organizations and names for um, uh, things, so papers, books, um, uh, research activities, etc. So uh, the big question everyone has is can names actually be cleaned up? And my answer is of course they can if we start using digital names. Um, digital names being persistent identifiers that uniquely specify people, places, or things. So um, ORCID's role in this is providing a persistent digital identifier for people, and in particular, people participating in the research community. Uh, the picture on this slide shows three people, all with the same transliterated name of Koishi Tanaka. Um, and as you can see from the Japanese characters above their, um, above their picture, um, when you look at their name in Japanese characters, they are different. But when they are transliterated to um, English characters, or Roman characters, um, you find that they all have the same transliterated name. And so they all now have an ORCID identifier and a way of uniquely identifying themselves, even though they have the same name, when they are publishing or uh, creating data sets or interacting with the grants organization. So this is just one example of the utility of an um, identifier for a person. Um, but there are many, many others. It's not just for people with common names. So um, with ORCID, ORCID is very community uh, focused, but also researcher focused. For ORCID to be successful, researchers need to use their digital name. Um, but to benefit from ORCID, researchers really need only to do two things. The first one is to register for an identifier, and the second one is to use it. Um, and what I'm hoping um, on this call is to give uh, people on the call some ideas, some tools for how to communicate with researchers about engaging with ORCID, and also some ideas for you on how to uh, build ORCID identifiers and other um, persistent identifiers into your system. So this is my favorite slide. Um, it seems to have had a lot of resonance here <laughs> in Brisbane. Um, to use ORCID and to, this, to use identifiers effectively, actually any identifier, we have to get away from the notion that somebody can type an identifier into a form field. Um, for identifiers to be effective, we really need to move towards a model where people are collecting these identifiers using something we call authentication. So instead of typing an ID into a field, it's using um, an OAuth pathway. It's a little bit technical, but using this pathway to collect this identifier using that person's username and password into ORCID. Um, so this ensures that the person and that identifier belong together. It ensures that the identifier is entered um, into the form without any, <clears throat> pardon me, without any typographical errors. And it also ensures that during that form entry process, the individual can explicitly approve the use of their identifier data in their ORCID record um, within that system and perhaps beyond if you want to be able to publish information. So it's a really, really good way um, to work within uh, privacy mandates. All right, so as I mentioned, this isn't just about ORCID, it's about how we uh, bring together identifiers for people, places, and things. So I put together this handy dandy little diagram here to show you who is responsible for which part of this. 
Um, so ORCID provides an identifier registry. We have organizations like Crossref, Datacite, RDA, providing registries for DOIs, for publications, for data sets, and more. Um, we also have organizations like Fundref, which is a part of Crossref, um, and Ringgold providing organization identifiers. So, okay, we've got the organizations that provide identifiers. We rely on the community to use these identifiers, again, in an authenticated way. Um, so on the call, pretty sure we have folks from universities, from associations, uh, people who are managing data repositories, and perhaps even a few funders, maybe a publisher or two. Um, and so what we're doing is really requesting um, that each of these parts of the community start to use these identifiers and embed them into the systems that researchers are using on a daily basis. So universities, one, well, I can go into this. So I just want you, everyone to understand you all have a little piece of this. Not everyone has to do everything. Um, and that over time, it's really how do we work? How does ORCID, how does Crossref, how does Ringgold, Fundref, et cetera, help to support the community in building these connections? So sector responsibilities. Um, I put all the, the four big ones that we deal with, funders, universities, publishing repositories and associations on the screen here. Um, and I have two more slides right after this that go into funders and universities in more detail. Um, we'll make these slides available after um, the session. You can read this in a little bit more detail, but I didn't want to spend a huge amount of time going through all of this, but rather focus um, on universities and funders at the time being. And I'm happy to answer questions about other sectors when we get off the call. Um, so for universities, the big one really is asserting a relationship between a person and the university. And I could expand this and not just focus on universities, it's really research institutions, okay? And that could be a for-profit, a commercial, um, non-profit, or a university. Anyone that employs researchers, trains researchers, provides degrees to researchers. Um, so the big one here for these organizations is asserting that affiliation between a person's ORCID identifier and the organizational identifier. Um, some other ones are using identifiers and thesis and dissertation workflows. This is a really wonderful way of tying together all three identifiers, ORCID ID for the person, an ID for the thesis, and an ID for the organization in an authenticated, um, validated electronic open record that's available to the researcher and to you um, for um, you know, further career tracking or career progression purposes. Um, also, um, using identifiers during the on and off boarding of staff is a really great way to start collecting these identifiers. So you're actually tying those identifiers into your human resources, personnel, or identity management systems at the university or at the, at the research institute. Um, a lot of universities are starting to connect identifiers to research information management systems, like a faculty profile system, and then use this um, identifier and use ORCID tools to receive updates from ORCID when that record is, when the record is, has new items added to it. And I'll talk a bit about how that's happening starting yesterday, actually. But at the bottom of this page, again, a really very, very important thing to do is engage the researchers at your institution to register and to use their identifier. This is not something we need to do for the researcher. It's something we need to do with the researcher. And so we at ORCID and also the folks at ANS and at AAF are really here as your partners in this endeavor to figure out how we can best engage the researchers in using these identifiers. Okay, I'm hoping there's a couple folks um, from funders on the call. Um, funders tend to want a lot of information from all of us, and now we're asking for funders to give a little back. <laughs> so um, on this page, as you can see, a big one for funders is to assert a relationship between a funding award and an ORCID identifier. If we can bring in the identifier for the grant, an identifier for the funding organization, and the identifier for the ORCID, uh, for the person, um, and make that, just like we did for the thesis in universities, make that a public record. Um, that can help to lubricate a lot of other things that are going on in the community. For example, understanding when somebody submits a manuscript, which grants they might have that might have been used to help support the research described in that manuscript. Having that information in an asserted record in ORCID then makes it possible for the publisher to ingest that information during manuscript submission 
And that person can then choose which one or several of those grants that are active on their ORCID record um, that relate to the manuscript being submitted. So now you don't have to worry about metadata. Um, metadata is already there. You have grant identifiers, and you know the person and the grant belong together. So there's a lot of um, benefits for having an asserted public record um, between identifiers that can then be used in these workflows. Also, that means then that um, the funder needs to start asking for identifiers during grant application, but also to bring these identifiers, not just ORCID again, through the grant application and award process and then publish that at the end of the day in the public award information. Um, and the funder can also benefit by receiving updates from ORCID as the person publishes. And again, I'll show you how that's working in a minute. And lastly, um, most importantly, again, engaging the researchers to register and use their identifier, making it clear why the funder is doing this and making it clear the benefit to the researcher in engaging. All right, so what does this look like? I'm going to show you what this looks like from a visual perspective. I realize I probably need to put some XML on the screen. Um, I don't know how many people actually like looking at XML, but I'm happy to do that. I'll probably do that in the next iteration of this deck. Um, so here's an example of taking a person's ORCID ID and combining it with the Ringgold ID for the organization, asking at this time when you're collecting that ID, so this person's onboarding, let's say, at the university or coming into an association as a new or renewing member, you can then say, here's a person. Um, they use the uh, process that uh, we help enable at the university um, to couple their ORCID identifier with the university. Um, and the university can ask for um, what we call read and write permissions from that researcher. So um, can we, the university, can we, the requester, um, see your ORCID record, um, things that might not be public on that record? Can we, the requesting organization, also write information into that record? If you um, ask for these write permissions, um, you can then, as the employer, post information into the ORCID record saying this person, this ORCID ID, and this organization, in this case, the University of Colorado Boulder, belong together or are affiliated in an employment relationship. Um, and it not only provides the linkage between the two identifiers, it also provides provenance on the record. So it says who made that assertion. So how are these two related? In this case, that assertion is made by the University of Colorado at Boulder. So you now not only have a relationship, you have some level of trust that this relationship actually is the case. And now that the University of Colorado has written this into that person's ORCID record, they can also update it when that person, if that person should leave the organization with an end date. All right, so this is how you bring people and places together. Um, there is also a discussion I just found out yesterday, actually just yesterday this happened, where RepEds has actually put out a recommendation for adding ORCID into um, what's called an EduPerson schema. So anybody who's involved with identity providers and log in um, will understand what this means. Um, the concept now is that as people log into systems using Shibboleth, for example, um, ORCID can become a piece of the information that, exchange, that is exchanged during uh, the login process. Um, so that's um, the second bullet there. Um, we now have somebody, uh, the Swiss um, EDU identity provider, is now allowing this process to happen. Um, and ORCID is actually in process of working with the folks in the Netherlands as well. And this is actually a use case that ORCID and AAF are working on here in Australia. So we're really, really looking forward to um, being able to develop some very specific use cases here in Australia. So what does this look like in action? So this rolled out yesterday, and I'm really excited about it. So here is a person at the top of the screen. I think you can see my mouse. Um, person with their ORCID identifier. They come to submit a manuscript to a publisher. They include their ID when they submit that, again, using a, a way to collect the identifier that doesn't involve typing. Um, the publisher then reviews um, or goes through the review process. The manuscript is accepted. And that identifier is then passed along from the publisher to Crossref when, uh, when the manuscript is published. So now you have uh, information, metadata stored at Crossref that includes an ORCID identifier. And Crossref is now alerting the ORCID record holder that, hey, we now have a published manuscript, or not a manuscript, information about a manuscript that's just been published where you have included your ORCID ID 
and then automatically updating that person's ORCID record. Really handy, that means the individual, all they needed to do was include their ID at manuscript submission, which takes about 30 seconds, and their individual ORCID record becomes updated. But not just that, any system that is receiving notifications from ORCID can also receive um, an update that, hey, this person is published, and this is the authoritative metadata about that publication, including the publication DOI and an asserted linkage between the person's ORCID ID and that DOI. So this can be used to update university libraries. If you have an open access repository, it can be used to trigger an alert back to the researcher asking for the preprint. Um, if you are running a faculty profile system, it's a very straightforward way to keep that profile system updated. If you are a funder and care about uh, what publications or data sets, so data sets involved in SOL, what data sets your researchers are um, producing, you can receive an update when that's published instead of a year after. So it's a really good way of keeping track of what's going on. Um, if you want more information about what to do, some ideas for use cases, examples of what others are doing, uh, some outreach materials, ways to contact us, code samples, the whole caboodle is available at members.orchid.org here on the screen. Um, you can see that there are some specific um, buttons here for different parts of the community. Um, you click on those buttons and that will bring up uh, different kinds of information um, and more ways to look at, hmm, how might I at my own organization want to engage with this process? Um, I want to talk a little bit about what's happening um, internationally. Um, this slide shows uh, different things that are happening. We have some places like Austria, um, Portugal, and Sweden where there's a national recommendation but also a funder requirement for using ORCID identifiers during grant submission. And we other, also have um, countries like the United Kingdom and um, Italy that have um, this year also uh, committed to a uh, national consortium for implementing ORCID across uh, the research uh, community. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So the first uh, national consortium that launched was Denmark in 2014. This involved all eight universities in Denmark. Um, and the goal there really is to get 80% participation by researchers um, to support the formation of a national repository of publications um, that is going to be used for a national assessment. Um, so they started that in 2014. Sorry. Um, and the chart on the side shows um, how they're doing in terms of getting to their 80% mark. Um, this particular um, national consortia does not involve the funder um, and just the universities. But you can see that you know, some are doing quite well and some have a bit of a ways to go. Um, in Italy, um, they launched a national consortium in the, let me think here, it was July this year. There are now 74, if I didn't say UK, I should say Italy, I'm sorry, <laughs> 74 Italian universities and research institutes are participating in this consortium. This is led by one of the uh, ministries in Italy. Um, it involves the um, CRUI, which is the Conference of Italian University Rectors. So they've got both government and university participation and very high level um, research office university participation. Uh, they are using one um, platform for integration that's built by Chinica, um, which is also a government organization. Um, and they are using um, a DSpace CRIS. Um, so the universities have a platform. They don't have to build something on their own. They basically need to just plug into that platform uh, to be able to enable connections between their researchers and their identifiers. So it's a, a fairly um, centralized way of engaging with ORCID. Their goal is similar to Denmark. They want to ensure that at least 80% of their researchers have an ID and then actually connect that identifier out into existing databases. In their case, they're focusing on Scopus. Um, and their goal is to get um, the 80% participation by the end of next year with the links out. And actually, they want to get 80% participation by, I think it's November this year, um, and then give people time to link it out to other databases. Um, in the UK, uh, the UK launched a consortium also in July this year. Uh, there are now over 40 universities, actually, um, that have joined the, the consortium. Uh, UK has a very different approach from Italy and Denmark in that each university has a different approach. Um, there is no overarching mandate for percent participation. 
or how each university is going to be embedding ORCID. Um, everyone has their own way. Um, at the end of the day, uh, I think the goal here is to feed into their national evaluation exercise, the REF, um, and also support open access compliance requirements. Um, and the bottom bullet here says that uh, the funders and the charities may form a separate consortia. The last I've heard actually is that the RCUK are likely to join um, the uh, UK consortia with the other universities. So um, we'll hear more about that in the coming month or so. Um, so now we have Australia with a joint statement of principle. I was trying to download the pictures today, put one in here. <laughs> Um, but I'm really, really excited about working with Australia, um, and I think Heath is not here, but we will be working with AAF um, on technical support, on um, developing FAQs for Australia. Um, we will be working very, very closely with AAF um, to interact with um, universities and funders and the research institutes in Australia, as well as with ANDS. So, um, as I said, I'm really excited about this. Uh, you have not seen the last of me. Um, and the other thing I did want to mention is that um, ORCID will be back um, in Australia in February. Between the 15th and the 17th, we'll be in Canberra um, hosting or co-hosting an ORCID outreach meeting with ANDS and AAF. Um, and we look forward to seeing you there. And we'll be posting a little bit more information about what that meeting entails and who's involved in the coming uh, month or so. So I guess I can probably end there and take questions if people have it, or do you want to add any? Actually, I think Natasha's going to add a bit about AAF. Yeah. Uh, okay. Hi, everybody. Um, okay, he unfortunately hasn't been able to make it to the webinar, so I'm just going to give you a little update on what is happening with the Australian Orchid Consortium. So uh, you should be able to see the screen there, uh, which is what's on the AN site at the moment uh, about the Australian Orchid Consortium. So essentially we've put out a call for expressions of interest for institutions who wanted to participate in Australian Orchid Consortium. We put that uh, call out in August, about mid-August, and it closed in mid-September. And we asked for a single institutional response, uh, preferably from the DBCRs. And we received a total of 41 responses, a couple trickled in a bit late, um, which include, included a number of Australian universities, uh, the two major research councils, the Australian Research Council and the National Health and Medical Research Councils, um, a couple of government agencies like the CSIRO and ANSTO, um, and some medical research institutes as well. So that's people who are interested in joining the consortium. The next steps are that um, AAF have gone through their due diligence process and they are now, having signed the agreement yesterday, are now the consortium lead for, the, for Australia. And they will be sending a copy of what's called an accession agreement to people who put out an expression of interest. And that accession agreement has to be signed by the institution and given back to the AAF by the end of November. And then after that, you're issued with a payment invoice for the consortium, which needs to be paid within the December period. And then the consortium uh, will go live on the 1st of January 2016. Uh, we're looking at having some sort of a launch event in association with the, with the ORCID outreach meetings in Canberra on the 15th to the 17th of February. So you can pencil that in your diaries. Uh, and the AAF, if you look at the screen there, they've actually got some information on their website. So they, they are actually the place to go to for the consortium um, information here. They've got, um, they've actually put a whole lot of information up there that we don't um, have on the ANS website. Uh, and there's also an email address there if you want to submit queries to the consortium. So uh, I think the one point that Heath would have wanted me to make was that the agreement uh, can't be changed, that the agreement that the accession agreement that you're asked to sign, but you can certainly make queries of the AAF, and that is because all members of the consortium need to sign the same agreement. So it can't be changed. If there's 41 members, then 41 need to uh, want to change that agreement. So I think that gives you an idea of the timeframes and what's involved, and I think we might open it up to uh, question and answers. Is there a question there? All right, it asks, uh, there's a question, how many government agencies have signed up and is there the possibility for more institutions to sign up that haven't already expressed interest? Yes, 
Yes and yes. <laughs> so uh, the, there are two government agencies who put in an expression of interest. One was the CSIRO and the other one is ANSTO, the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation. Um, but we certainly welcome uh, more government agencies who would like to be part of this. Um, and expression of interest just basically people didn't sign anything to do that. It just meant we were trying to gauge the level of interest in a consortium. So you definitely have time to come on board. Uh, if you're interested, just drop that. Uh, there's an email address. I think it's orchid at AAF. Uh, it's somewhere on the page there. Maybe it's under become a member. There you go. Orchid at aaf.edu.au. So if you send them an email, they can send you the accession agreement and you can uh, look it over and see if you'd like to be part of the consortium. So there's definitely time. Uh, the 30th of November is when those agreements need to be in. And we will also be um, emailing the lists, the e-lists that each of the Orchid working group members are part of, which is, you know, call, court it, um, I can't remember them all, AAF, Universities Australia um, and ANS to get that information and ARMS as well to get that information out there so that um, because uh, people who expressed an expression of interest we will email the accession agreement directly to them but we will also put out a general email to the e-list so that people will know about what's, what's happening and you can prompt your senior people to sign the agreement if you want to be part of it. Okay, well thank you very much for attending the webinar today. If you think of any questions after the webinar, anything you want to ask, you can uh, you can drop a line through that awkward address or you can uh, contact Anne's, contact me, and we'll find a way to answer your questions. So thanks again and thank you very much, Laurie. For thank you. Thank you very much.